So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for our Celebrate English Wine Week with Ridgeview. It's English Wine Week as of Saturday and so we wanted to do a special event to, to collaborate with Ridgeview to mark the occasion and also for Ridgeview's 25th anniversary. We were, we were planning to do an in, in class event um, before lockdown so we thought next best, next best thing we could uh, do an online webinar for you. Uh, my name is Lydia Harrison, I'll be uh, keeping an eye on the chat so if you have any questions for Brandon please feel um, just type them in and I'll keep an eye on the chat and then collate them all and field them together uh, at the end. And if you want to watch this back, it uh, will be recorded and then available on the WSG School website under student information, webinar recordings. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Brandon Barnum, who's Ridgeview's uh, Business Development Manager, and he's going to take, take it away and tell them everything they need to know about English, English wine and Ridgeview. Thank you very much, Lydia. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining this evening. Um, so it's a pretty, hopefully sort of fun and informal um, webinar. Um, we're probably gonna, it's gonna be run for about an hour um, and we're gonna talk about um, the kind of history of English wine, how it started and kind of the key developments that we've seen over, the, over its history. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Vitti and, and Vinny in the UK and sort of generalize a bit. Um, and then we will cover Ridgeview, kind of our family story um, and the place and sort of how we fit into the industry and a couple of developments that we've seen over the last 25 years of, of making wine in the UK. Um, so as Lydia says, if you've got any questions to shout, um, just pop them in the chat um, and there'll be a QA and a towards the end of the session. Um, and I'll try and answer to the best of my capabilities. Um, we've also got Mardi, who's our director of communications, also part of the family, the Roberts family. Um, she's also attending, so uh, she may be responding on my behalf. So thank you, Marty, in advance. Cool. So um, English Wine Week, um, so it started on, I think, Saturday. Um, it runs over two weekends, so it's a little bit longer than a, than a week. I think it's about nine days. But the idea of English Wine Week is just to celebrate um, all things English wine um, and to raise the awareness of the category um, and, yeah, just generally get drinking and, and talking a bit more about, about English wine. Um, so we thought we'd partner with the, the WSET um, and share kind of our experience of 25 years of making wine in the UK um, and kind of you know, some of the key overviews of, of various parts of, of, of the industry. Um, so the first slide here, this is just a, this is very kindly taken from the guys at Wine GB who are sort of our overall um, kind of body in the UK or wine body in the UK. Um, and this is a kind of current Kind of situation or an overview of the English wine industry. Um, so as you can see there's quite a few vineyards now in the UK, there's 658 vineyards, um, 164 wineries, um, production has um, doubled and doubled again over the last sort of 10-15 years um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the history in a second um, but as of 2018 we, we produced 13, just over 13 million bottles in the UK. Um, which was a massive increase on 2017, albeit it was a very, very warm and good vintage, record-breaking vintage. Um, but really, in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, the English wine industry um, is probably only about 30 years old, so very young industry. Um, there was sort of evidence or traces um, that we've been making wine in the UK um, back in the sort of Roman times. And it's generally agreed that the Romans did introduce the vine to the UK. Um, but really in, in the sort of modern industry, um, it was only really as recent as the, as the 1950s when there was a bit of a commercial revival. Um, that was led by a producer called Hambledon, uh, which I'm sure um, some of you are more than familiar with, based down in Hampshire. Um, so it was actually 1951 they started out. Um, focusing on a lot of the German varietals. Um, so varietals such as Seval Blanc, Müller Thurgau, um, and those sort of early, early ripening um, sort of aromatic varietals. Um, and it wasn't really until the early, early 90s, late 80s, um, where we started introducing more international varietals um, into UK soil. Um, so the introduction of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Mernier, which are the three most planted Great varieties in the UK now. Um, I think that's led by Pinot Noir, followed by Chardonnay um, and Pinot Meunier. Um, and there's also uh, Bacchus is quite widely grown in the UK. We'll talk about those three varietals uh, moving forward. 
the concentration of vineyards um, is predominantly around the southeast, in particular Sussex and Kent. Um, and there's some noteworthy vineyards along the along the west as well. Um, so uh, Dever, Devon, Dorset, Cornwall. Um, and increasingly, there's more and more plantings um, up in East Anglia. Um, so we've got some promising vineyards coming on board uh, in Suffolk, which is pretty exciting. Um, so that's a bit of an overview. And as you can see, the the the, the main focus is sparkling wine in the UK. Um, so about 70% of our production focusing on sparkling. About 99% of that, I believe, is is traditional method, and we'll talk about that moving forward. Um, and there's 31% uh, still wine made. Um, and there's actually been quite a shift and an increase in recent years um, in the production of still wines in the UK. Um, so that's a bit of an overview, but really the in the last sort of 30 years, you know, even more recently than that, the, the industry has rocketed. Um, and, you know, the number of commercial vineyards has, has you know, grown massively. Um, you can see there, 2019, there was 3 million vines planted. The year before that, 1.6. So you can see the, the growth there in acreage. Um, 13 million bottles altogether, covering, you know, 70% sparkling, 30% still wine. Um, Lydia, can I have the next slide, please? There we are. Cool. Um, so our story um, or our journey, if you like, started uh, back in 1995. Um, so it was so Ridgeview was founded by the Roberts family in 1995, uh, founded by Mike and his wife, Christine Roberts. Um, so photo on the left, um, the lady right at the back standing up, you've got Chris, Christine Roberts. Um, so her and her husband, Mike Roberts, founded Ridgeview in 1995. Um, before they founded Ridgeview, they owned a successful IT business. Um, they lived in the south of England in Burgess Hill. Um, they grew that to a pretty significant size. Um, so by the late 80s, um, they had around about 600 members of staff. So it was a pretty large company in IBM distribution. Um, they were thinking about kind of semi-retirement and sort of the next chapter of their lives. Um, and they were very fortunate they were approached by a, an investor. Um, they decided to cash that business in. Um, and that gave them the capital necessary to start their sort of dream, dream retirement project, really, um, which was Ridgeview. Um, so they started investigating and, and sort of doing their due diligence around what you can do in the UK in terms of uh, plantings and grape varietals. Um, and their investigation pointed them towards um, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Menu. Um, so they found a 30 acre estate in Ditchling, which is where we're based now. Um, so just over the South Downs from Brighton. So it's about a 10 minute drive over the South Downs. Uh, planted a 10 acre vineyard, um, set up a little winery. I think they started off with like a little one ton Wilms press in, in the granary. Um, they bought a bungalow with, with, with the, the estate um, and started making traditional methods sparkling wine. Um, and back then English wine, you know, hadn't really been, um, you know, it, it didn't really have a, a great reputation. It didn't have a great name. Um, so they were, you know, they were pretty crazy to take on that sort of risk as a retirement. Um, I think initially it started out as their, their kind of hobby really. Um, and then, you know, a few years in, I think they entered the wine into a competition and it gave some pretty decent recognition. Um, and they just kind of grew and grew and grew. And so 25 years down the line, um, you know, we, we picked up some amazing accolades and achievements, um, and our wines are exported all over the world. Um, so really the, the Ridgeview and the, and the industry has gone from strength to strength. So it was all founded by Mike and Chris back in 1995. Um, nowadays the company is run by their daughter and son. So it's stepped down into the second generation of the, of the Roberts family. So in the picture on the right there, you've got Tamara on the left, who's our CEO. And her brother Simon stood next to her um, as our head winemaker. Um, Mardi, who, who's in the background behind the scenes, uh, is married to Simon. Um, so she looks after our, our, our marketing and communications um, and then Tamara um, she's also married to the other gentleman on the left hand side on the left photo at the back um, also called Simon um, who looks after sort of our technical side of things so actively you know there's sort of five family members um, within the business and pushing and driving the business forward um, the kids in the photo so they both got um, so both Tam and Simon um, have got 
two kids, two boys. Um, they're probably sort of 13, 14 now. So slowly getting into the age of, of getting involved with the family business. Um, so we've, we've done a couple of uh, kind of chef pop-up dinners over the last couple of years, um, pre-COVID, um, which were great fun. We worked, collaborated with some really um, sort of close friends and chef friends of ours. Um, and they've been helping out sort of in, in behind the scenes in the kitchen and whatnot. So slowly getting into that sort of third generation of the family. Um, but family's in the heart of everything we do. Um, we're a team probably now of about 30 people, um, but everything you know, is, is sort of all family orientated um, with a focus on producing high quality traditional methods of sparkling wine. Um, so that was kind of where our journey started really. Um, so Mike and Chris, 1995, second generation now have taken over and at the helm of, of what we do. Could I have the next slide please, Lydia? Should be coming, so I think there's a slight delay. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Awesome. Cool. Um, so going into the vineyard, and we're going to we'll talk a bit more generally about growing fruit in the UK, um, as well as um, what we get up to on a yearly cycle. Um, but as I said earlier, the focus is on Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, and Chardonnay. Um, there are quite a quite a few um, sparkling producers that also plant Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, the, the three sort of noble varietals are the focus. Um, overall in the UK, um, warmth is, is sort of key to success. We're looking for overall warmth in, in a sort of microclimate, um, coupled with sort of low rainfall, um, good drainage, um, southern exposure is, is the ambition. So that vineyard um, there in the photo is south facing, you've got the south downs there. Um, trying to maximise that sun's intensity. Um, and usually low sort of low level vineyards above sea. So usually about under 150 metres um, below sea level is kind of key in the UK. Um, most vineyards are planted across a range of soils, but the key soils are chalk, um, clay and also green sand. Um, so those are the sort of three key soils in the UK and, and have seen success over, the, over, over our history. Um, but the key thing is in the UK, we have this extremely long growing season. Um, so bud burst usually takes place in, in April. Um, and we're usually picking as a big generalization, sort of first week of October. Um, and as a result of that long growing window, um, the fruit um, concentration um, shows and is pretty significant. So the, the fruit purity and, and sort of concentration through that extra window or that extra hang time um, really shows itself. So we'll talk about sort of the key qualities and characteristics um, of English wine a bit later on when we're tasting, um, but really it's sort of characterized by super high acidity um, and intense sort of fruit concentration, which is driven by this really long growing season. Um, so challenges in the UK, um, viticulture scene, um, we have quite a few. Um, but the most sort of noteworthy um, of challenges is frost. Um, and frost comes in at bud burst, um, which is around that sort of time there, um, the photo on the right hand side. We get this really delicate area of plant tissue appear, um, shoots begin to sort of um, appear, leaf, leaf area begins to unfurl, um, and very sensitive, very delicate um, against frost. Um, year on year, we've seen We've seen yields um, devastated um, as, a, as an industry as a whole um, by, by frost. So I think um, 2017 in particular was a very bad year for frost in England. Um, 16 was also relatively bad. Um, but really um, frost protection is, is crucial. Um, so on the left, the photo on the left is, is a picture of our frost prevention method that we use at Bridgeview, um, extensively across all of our, all of our vineyards. Um, so what we do is we import uh, what, call, what, what they're called bougies, the, the giant candles essentially, so five litre paint pots. Um, we cover the whole site in those um, and in nights where there's frost we head out, or when I say we, the lovely guy in the, on the right there, Max, our vineyard manager, and his um, uh, vineyard assistant Tom head out. They light the, light the bougies um, with the, the aim of producing these sort of hot air currents. Um, which give off you know enough sort of hot air to sort of relieve a bit of um 
you know, relieve a bit of that frost around the plant tissue. Um, and so it just takes that edge away just to stop that kind of frost burn from happening. So pretty labor intensive. Fortunately, um, you know, Chris, um, who lives, Chris Roberts, the founder who lives on site, um, lets them sort of camp at hers for the evening. So they're constantly checking the weather stations um, when there's frost predicted. Um, and they head out and um, light the bougies um, to protect against frost. Um, but yeah, to, I think on average, um, you know, fr frost is by far the biggest issue and threat to UK viticulture. Um, there's lots of other frost prevention methods in place, um, such as sort of like giant fans, um, kind of suction cannons, um, other sort of fan and um, air moving devices that exist as well. Um, but the one that we found most effective um, at Ridgeview um, and has provided us you know, pretty good results so far as our, our bougies that we get over um, from France. Um, so that's you know, usually the start of the growing season for us. Uh, this year was pretty bad. Like we had, we had a couple of bad nights. Um, I think overall we protected the vines pretty well. Um, so overall damage is, is not, um, you know, is, is, is good. Like we, we haven't had much damage. Um, and yeah, that's really the sort of key focus and start of the growing season for us. Um, before bud burst, we're usually uh, pruning, so everything gets pruned, um, cut back in preparation for the growing season. But frost is the sort of number one, um, number one issue and, and sort of thing that we focus on the start of the growing season. Um, moving or fast forwarding um, into further into the growing season, um, the next crucial stage to take place happens usually towards the end of June, um, sort of mid to, mid to end of June, kind of, kind of where we're at, at now really, uh, where we're going through the flowering place at process. Um, so the little inflorescence appear, um, we start getting the development of little berries after about seven days in. Um, and again, that's a very crucial stage for us in the UK, um, given the, the sort of high levels of, of rainfall that we, that we witness year on year. Um, and usually we're just crossing our fingers um, for good, good fruit set um, and a good number of bunches per vine um, during the, the flowering slash fruit set process. Um, the race on where the grapes change colour um, usually takes place towards the end of August in the UK. Um, so the, the grapes tend to become a little bit more elastic, um, the skin's a bit more sensitive and they begin to ripen. Um, and depending on the weather outside, depends on how long obviously the, the fruit stays in the vine for. Um, but usually, you know, four or five weeks um, hang time to, to develop and ripen. Um, monitoring a very crucial level of acidity and sugar ripeness. And once we're happy with those results, um, we usually um, send in our pickers and everyone gets all hands on deck. Um, and we pick all, all the grapes by hand. Um, so Lydia, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Be there. <laughs> cool. Uh, so yeah, so first week of October, as I said, as a, as a broad generalization, uh, the fruits harvested by hand, um, so um, thoroughly assessed in the vineyard and then loaded into picking crates, which you can see on the left there. Um, those crates then get sent to our winery, uh, ready for processing. Um, and usually we're harvesting I mean, 2018 actually was a very long harvest. We were, I think we were harvesting for about nine weeks in total. Um, so very, very long harvest. Um, and usually the sort of, the trend is that we're, you know, over the 25 years that we've been collecting data and seeing harvests across multiple vineyards that we work with, um, we're usually sort of harvesting from east to west um, as, a, as a sort of trend. Doesn't necessarily, um, um, exactly sort of equate to that but that's as a, as a generalization as a trend we're usually you know going from east to west um, across the country harvesting fruit um, and I probably should highlight at this stage that um, at Ridgeview um, as a business model uh, we work very closely with grower vineyards um, so as a percentage we probably only own about 10 percent of our land which is the the vineyard that you can see there in the photo um, and the rest of the fruit we partner very closely with grower vineyards across the South Downs National Park and beyond. Um, so really from you know, Ham Hampshire, Surrey, Sussex, Kent, um, and as I said earlier, now and I've been in East Anglia. Um, and 
Matt, our vineyard manager, worked very closely with our vineyards, um, ensuring that we, you know, they're carrying out the right practices um, and the consultation is there when, when needed. Um, and essentially, at the end of the growing season, um, that fruit gets sent to the winery where we then process it. Um, and we've got some really nice long term relationships in place with our grower vineyards. Um, so, one of our most long standing uh, growers is a vineyard in West Sussex called Tinwood, sort of over Chichester Way. Um, and they supply us with sort of the main majority of our, of our fruit um, for Ridgeview. Um, also in the winery, and we'll talk a little bit about production and production levels in a second, but in the winery we, um, we do quite a lot of contract winemaking. So I would say about a third of our overall production um, is dedicated to contract winemaking. So we make wine for other vineyards, um, vineyards that don't necessarily have the facilities or the or the winemaking team behind them um, to make a wine. Um, so that's where we get involved and um, you know they come in and, and work with us on the blending. Um, we also produce a range of own labels, um, which we can talk about later on as well. Um, so that's a little bit about our business model really. Um, so we work a lot with a grower of vineyards, um, which you read extensively about in the sort of Champagne region, um, but also we do quite a lot of contract winemaking uh, for a range of different vineyards. Um, so going back to, back to that first slide, obviously there were 650 vineyards, um, but only 160 of them that actually owned a winery and produced wine. So there's quite a lot of growing that happens in the UK as well. Cool, next slide. Fantastic. So, <laughs> thank you, Lydia. Cool. Um, so in the winery, um, we, so we bring all the fruit in, um, in those little baskets. Um, we load the press um, by hand. Um, most um, producers in the UK were using um, horizontal basket press, so cockard. Um, there's also um, quite a few wilms knocking about, so the German pneumatic bag press. Um, we have both actually at Ridgeview, we have two four tons, one pneumatic, uh, one cockard press. Um, very gentle pressing is crucial. Um, so again, as a generalization, most producers in England uh, follow you know, pretty much the process is set out by the CIBC in Champagne. Um, so very similar kind of pressing models. Um, so just to go into that briefly, so usually we're, we're usually pressing in two different stages. Um, so the fruit goes in whole bunch, um, which is key. Um, the first part of the pressing cycle known as the cuvee um, is extracted first. Um, and the cuvee tends to be um, sort of the most delicate, the most the sort of leaner style out of the, the two types of pressing that we do um, and carries probably most desirable qualities and characteristics. Um, then once that's extracted um, and as a percentage we're probably extracting roughly 50% of cuvee um, if you're looking at sort of volume to weight ratio. Um, we press a little bit harder after the cuvee to extract what is called the tie uh, which can be very important later on down the line. But because we're pressing a tiny bit harder, the Thai uh, tends to give off a little bit of extra uh, flavour and a little bit more phenolic uh, characters. Um, probably 10% um, extraction on, on the Thai, um, and that's used um, and very important for adding a bit of body and structure later on when the wines are all blended together. Um, and then the remaining sort of 35-40% um, fruit left in the press um, is generally um, used to feed cattle, uh, reintroduced back into soil, um, and also um, sort, of, sort of partnered with distilleries to, to produce a, a byproduct such as a gin, etc. Um, the reason why we don't use that 35-40% is because past that tie extraction would be pressing too hard, um, and we'd be releasing too many unwanted characteristics um, into the overall um, blend. Um, so we're all about the sort of delicate extraction of juice um, in our, you know, in, in extracting our, our base juice, really. Um, so that's really important, the pressing cycle. Um, once we pressed all the juice, um, that goes straight into stainless steel tank at Ridgeview, um, where it's left to settle for a couple of days, just to let any sort of um, separation occur, um, before it's then inoculated. 
Um, so we use a dry cultured yeast, we rehydrate that, that goes in. Um, and then fermentation, first fermentation is well underway. Um, and that fermentation usually takes about seven days. Um, and at the end of that, at the end of the, um, the first fermentation, we usually end up with a base wine that's sitting around about 10.5% ABV, super high acidity, um, and just ultra fruit concentration from the, you know, as a result of that long growing season in, in the UK. Um, following first fermentation, um, we, or at Ridgeview, most years, I'd probably say there's only maybe four or five years that, um, you know, certain parcels, um, you know, haven't. But most years we are putting the wine through malolactic fermentation. Um, so converting that, that sort of harsh, bright malic acid, which is, uh, you know, very much present in, in UK grapes, um, into that softer lactic acid. Um, that rounds out that acidity profile very nicely um, and makes the wine a little bit more softer and creamier and sort of buttery in style. Then what we do is, um, that's where the expertise really of Simon, the head winemaker, comes into play. Uh, so he'll take a, a parcel or a sample from each of the tanks um, and he'll begin the blending um, part of the process. Um, and so we'll talk about the range and the Ridgeview range um, and the different styles that we produce um, but really at blending for our sort of core signature wines, which are non-vintages. The aim is producing a consistent style year on year. Um, and then our vintage sort of specific wines that we produce um, will usually be a, you know, a true representation of that single vintage. Um, but really for Simon, it's um, you know, ensuring that consistency year on year for our non-vintage wines. Um, so you'll see in the photo there, a lot of those tanks, the larger tanks, um, are actually sort of three stacked on top of each other. So we've got probably about 70 individual tanks. Um, so all of the parts of the pressing, the three varietals from all the different parcels of land that we harvest fruit from, which I believe is about 10, um, is all fermented separately. Um, so at blending, he has, you know, a lot of different base wines um, and samples um, to choose from to try and create this consistency year on year. Um, that coupled with um, reserve wine that we keep in tank um, each vintage. Um, and we try and hold a, a decent stock of reserve wine back um, to introduce um, an extra layer of complexity year on year. Um, so that's, you know, kind of the start of the process. So um, it's, it's very, very similar to, you know, the processes, as I said, set out by the CIBC. So very gentle pressing, first fermentation, um, malolactic fermentation followed by blending um, and after blending everything's pretty much ready to go straight into bottle um, so there's a little bit of, there's a couple of processes in between um, so we cold settle again um, cold stabilize um, filter um, and then we add second batch of sugar and yeast to the bottle um, which is sealed with a crown cap um, and then taken down um, underneath the winery, you can see our um, sort of cellar shot there on the left. All the bottles are sort of hand stacked uh, from the floor to the ceiling in deep caverns, um, where they undergo that second fermentation, um, which is so crucial for the traditional method of sparkling wine. Um, the second fermentation takes place over six to eight weeks. Um, in, the, in that time, obviously, there's a second fermentation that takes place in the bottle. Um, a little bit of extra ABV is created which is roughly 1.5%, bringing our total volume up to 12. The pressure created as a result of that CO2 that can't escape from the bottle um, produces a, you know, an atmosphere of pressure around about six bar, um, so a lot of pressure in that bottle. Um, once it's finished fermenting and all the, all the sugar has been consumed by all the yeast, the yeast cells die off. Um, and they sit on the side of the bottle um, for a period of extra aging, uh, known as the autolysis or lees aging. Um, at Ridgeview, we're aging between 18 months and up to 10 years, depending on the stars that we're producing. Um, and we'll talk about that in the next slide when we're covering the range. Um, but obviously, the, the more youthful stars at 18 months, we are trying to enhance the, the sort of fruit purity style um, and kind of quality. Um, and then the stars that we're leaving on leaves for longer, um, it's all about enhancing that kind of autolytic, brioche, biscuity quality. Um, 
But overall, um, for our core range, Bloomsbury, Cavendish and Fitzrovia, we're typically aging about 18 months. Um, and the idea and the ambition really is to really showcase this kind of pure fruit focus style um, that the wines in England um, really you know, kind of celebrate and highlight. Um, so that's pretty much um, the kind of first stages, I suppose, of the, of the winemaking process. So it's all about, um, you know, first fermentation, second fermentation, then the wines after second fermentation, we are riddling them down. Um, so we, we're starting the process of getting the yeast out of the bottle. Um, the wines are, uh, well, the necks of the bottles are frozen. Um, they are popped. The plug of ice that we have used, um, we, we've been freezing for the last sort of 10 minutes in, the, in these big glycol baths. Um, we, we pop the cap, the ice comes out with the yeast, um, that disgorging process. Um, and then we're topping that up with what is called dosage, which is very important um, in traditional methods of sparkling winemaking, um, which is usually made up of reserve wine um, and addition of sugar. That goes in, the cork then goes into the bottle, um, sealed with a muse layer crown cap, um, and then it's rested for a further three months um, before distribution, really. And that three months just allows that wine to settle a bit, uh, homogenize properly, because we've just added that little bit of 10 mil of dosage. Um, and then labelled up, packaged, ready to go out for, for distribution, really. Um, so that's, that's the winemaking process. And really from sort of grape to, to glass, you know, we're probably looking at about two years for, you know, our, our, our signature wine, Bloomsbury, as an example. Um, but yeah, as a, as a big generalisation, very similar processes to the, to the process set up by the CIBC. Um, there has been some interesting developments in the UK. Um, around, around um, different styles of sparkling, which we'll talk about probably at the end, maybe in the Q and A. It'll be interesting to to sort of hear people's views on that. Um, but we'll 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 cover that at a later stage. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, Lily? Cool. So this is the Ridgeview range. Um, we went through a big uh, sort of packaging or rebranding about two years ago, sort of mid twenty eighteen. Um, so um, hopefully you've all, you've all had the opportunity to see the, the sort of refreshed look. Um, but before that, the style of our packaging looked much more traditional. Um, so I know we had someone earlier who put in the comments they were drinking the Ridgeview 2014, which I, I think was under our old identity. Uh, very classic looking. Um, but yeah, in 2018 or 2017, we decided that we wanted a, a change and a, a big refresh to kind of modernize and make our labels a bit more contemporary looking and really stand out. So um, this is the kind of new identity of Bridgeview. Um, so the, the range is split into two. We've got, um, on the left, we've got what we call our signature wine. So Bloomsbury on the left, which is the wine we're gonna be focusing on on the tasting. I know Lydia's got a bottle. Uh, we've got the Cavendish um, and we've also got the Fitzroy beer. Um, so these styles are non-vintages. Um, the aim is consistency year on year when they're released, when the next batch is released. Um, they are aged for uh, 18 months on lees with the view of showcasing, again, that sort of fresh fruit forward style, um, but really the greatest introduction to what we do at Ridgeview. Um, and then on the right, um, we have our top tier wines. Um, they're vintage specific, known as our limited release. Um, so we've got on the, on the sort of left, the pink label, we've got our Rosé de Noir. Um, in the middle, we've got the Blanc de Blanc. Um, and on the right, we've got the Blanc de Noir. Um, and these, these guys typically spend longer on lees. They're made in much smaller quantities from the best parcels um, of fruit and, and, and parcels in a given vintage um, and set aside for extended lees aging um, to really highlight, you know, sort of extra speciality in those, in those styles. And they're produced only in the sort of best years. Um, so when the fruit's at its best, um, and Simon's almost dissecting each parcel as it's coming off the press and in the vineyard um, to ensure that it has the, you know, the spark. Um, so the wine of focus then we'll move in and we will cover and talk a little bit about the others, but um, just really to highlight the Bloomsbury and hopefully you've all got a glass of something English in front of you. Um, and even better if you've got a bottle of Bloomsbury or, or another from the range. Um, but Bloomsbury um, was the first wine we made at Ridgeview. Um, so we, we made this wine, the first 
time we ever made this one was back in 1996. Um, the style is Chardonnay dominant. So two thirds of the overall blend made up of Chardonnay. Um, and then the other third, Pinot Noir, Pinot Mernier. Um, it pretty much reflects our original plantings uh, that we planted back in 1995. Um, so if you come, and those, for those of you that have visited us, um, and hopefully will, or, and those, for those of you that will visit us in the future, hopefully post COVID, um, when you look outside our tasting room, you'll see about seven acres of Chardonnay. Um, and then if you take a little short walk through the trees, which you'll see when you, if you hopefully come on the tour, um, there, there's another three acres of Pinot Noir and Pinot Mernier. Um, and pretty much that, that blend um, represents our sort of original plantings um, in Ditchling that we planted back in 1995. Um, but the style is super clean. So Chardonnay in the UK grows, grows well, um, but it provides obviously that, that uh, piercing acidity, that, really fr that real fresh and clean style. Um, the Pinot Noir contributing the body and structure um, and the Mernier contributing roundness and sort of gentle aromatics. Um, but really super clean style because of that two thirds Chardonnay. Um, we also age it for 18 months. So the idea is to really showcase that fruit even further. Um, and then the Pinot Noir adding a little bit of roundness at the back. So super clean, fruit forward, a real celebration wine. Um, and it's our non-vintage style. Um, so um, where you can buy this, if, if you guys are interested in the future, you can obviously buy it from Ridgeview Direct. Um, but you can also pick it up in Waitrose and Nationwide. Um, so if you ever get the opportunity, by all means, um, give Bloomsbury a go. Um, it's you know, a really good introduction to what we do at Ridgeview and our sort of house style. Um, and as I said, as it's a non-vintage, the idea is to produce this consistent style year on year. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll just loosely cover the other, th the other five wines, because um, I know, you know, we're doing for time. We're going to do a bit of a QA. and a um, So the wine next to Bloomsbury Cavendish, um, if you wanted a really good um, comparison between Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and the sort of impact that that has on the overall blend, it's really good to compare Bloomsbury and Cavendish. So Cavendish is the opposite start of Bloomsbury. Um, so two thirds Pinot Noir, Pinot Mernier, one third Chard. Um, so it's really good to, to make a comparison of those two together side by side. Um, so it's a little bit rounder, um, has a little bit more earthier qualities, um, and is a little bit more um, gastronomic. Uh, the wine next to Cavendish, Fitzrovia, very similar style of wine to Bloomsbury. So it's a Chardonnay dominant rosé, uh, a blended rosé. Um, very pale and elegant, um, and a super sort of clean, refreshing, fruit forward style again. Um, and then moving on to the limiteds, um, we'll start with the wine in the middle, the Blanc de Blanc. Uh, this is the only wine we make that's a single vineyard wine. Um, so it come, it's 100% Chardonnay from our original plantings from 1995. So some of the oldest Chardonnay vines in England now. Um, so 25 year old Chardonnay vines. Um, and the fruit sort of opulence is really stands out in that, in that wine, followed by sort of three months aging. So um, a really sort of complex style, but super pure and clean. Um, and that is a vintage. So we're currently on, I think the 2015 vintage of the Blanc de Blanc. Um, and then the other two wines, um, Pinot Noir and Pinot Mernier only. So if we start on the left, the Rosé de Noir, um, is, is our Sanya method rosé, so a different style of rosé to the Fitzrovia. So whereas Fitzrovia uh, we make using a, a sort of blend, so we had a, a proportion of a red base wine from Pinot Noir in the winery to contribute this really delicate um, sort of pale colour. Um, with the Rosé de Noir, we're typically just leaving the, the juice on its skins at pressing for roughly six hours, um, so really gentle maceration to get this super pale rosé. This is a real winemaker's wine. This is actually uh, Simon, one of his favourite styles of, of wine um, that he makes at Bridgeview. Um, and it's lovely and creamy um, and has this sort of unique freshness. Um, and then on the right hand side, the final wine is the Blanc de Noir. Um, so this is Pinot Noir, Pinot Mernier only again, um, but this time with a little bit of extra um, Pinot Mernier added. So there's a little bit of more earthier qualities going on um, and a real sort of richness. So super gastronomic as a style. Um, but that really is our overall range. Hopefully, um, we look forward to welcoming you to Ridgely soon um, and we can take you through the range, um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully very soon. Um, and we've got quite a bit of time now um, for some questions. So um, I look forward to receiving them. And um, thank you very much for listening.
Thank you, Brandon. And yes, thank you for sending me um, some of the Bloomsbury. I've just been enjoying it while you've, you've been talking. Um, and yeah, I love their sort of Chardonnay backbone, that real sort of citrusy, grapefruit, lemon edge with the beautiful autolytic notes as well. Um, someone actually asked um, why you chose to, to keep the name Bloomsbury when you moved from the sort of vintage to the, to the non-vintage. So perhaps while, uh, while, while I'm tasting it, you could, uh, <laughs> you could answer that one. No problem at all. Yeah, so it's a good question. So um, back, in, back in the day, I mean, probably if we go back about maybe six, seven years, um, the wines were all after, were named after places in London. Um, so the Rosé de Noir used to be called uh, Victoria, the Blanc de Blanc used to be called um, Grosvenor, um, and then the Blanc de Noir used to be called Knightsbridge. So they're all after sort of key areas in London. Um, and that's, that really came from a story um, that Mike was a big believer, our founder of, um, of Christopher Merritt. Uh, so for those of you that aren't familiar with the story of Christopher Merritt, um, Christopher Merritt uh, was the first person to document on paper uh, the process of adding sugar and yeast to a, a bottle of wine to create this, this sparkle in a controlled environment. Um, and he lodged that, that discovery uh, back in uh, 1662 in the Royal Society in London, um, which was sort of 20, 30 years before uh, sort of Dom Perignon began perfecting that art. Um, so really Christopher Merritt um, was written about in, uh, in one of Tom Stevenson's uh, books and Mike, our founder, uh, was quite a cheeky chappy and loved the story. Um, and so decided to name the range after key areas in London to celebrate this story of Christopher Merritt um, and, his, and, his, and his sort of discovery back in 1662. But we moved, we moved over to these kind of internationally recognized terms um, as a really because they weren't getting as much recognition as we would like them to have done um, when they were sitting on, on restaurant wine lists. So to sort of further enhance their profile um, back well, sort of six, seven years ago when they're sitting on, on wine lists at, you know, um, at sort of a fairly good price, um, we, we decided to change them um, to make them a little bit more identifiable when they're sat, sat on the wine list. So that was the idea, but we wanted to keep the, the Bloomsbury Cavendish and Fitzrovia identity for our signature wines. Um, and as a kind of champion of that story of Christopher Merritt, really. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, definitely. And um, yeah, really nice, nice story behind it. I always like championing Christopher Merritt and uh, argue, arguing who invented what. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, be quite a few questions so I'll just sort of start at the beginning and see how far we can yeah, um, yeah. one of the others is, what is your favorite Ridgeview wine and food pairing always very topical very good question um, I, I'm going to keep it very simple um, Bloomsbury and oysters um, is, is benchmark pairing so um, you know Bloomsbury if you think about that really key citrus quality um, from the Chardonnay, um, it's, it's the equivalent of you know squeezing a lemon on the oyster. So it's it's just benchmark pairing, um, but also Cavendish and charcuterie and, and olives, um, and then Blanc de Noir. You know it can it can hold itself against you know even game and sort of mushroom based dishes. But I think for me, like the best, uh, yeah, the best pairing is it's got to be Bloomsbury um, and oysters or Blanc de Blanc fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I should have got some oysters in if I'd known. Now yeah, I know I really it. fancy one. It's definitely the kind of weather and a perfect uh, pair of teeth and absolutely <laughs> start to the, start to dinner. Um, someone else asked, "How is English sparkling wine um, received in the EU, and, and what are you doing to promote sales?" And obviously, I suppose the the conditions have changed a bit dramatically. But perhaps, <laughs> perhaps what were you yes, doing so. before, and what you're going to do? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think um, in the EU, um, increasingly, they're gaining more and more recognition. Um, so in particular, you know, the, the UK wine scene has very good success in the Nordics. So in particular, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Um, but we have entered uh, France, uh, Germany, uh, Italy. Um, so some of those key, you know, spark, sparkling producing regions. Um, and they're usually well received. Um, and they are different styles and different stylistically compared to, you know, champagne, compared to Prosecco, compared to Carver. So, um, you know, there's definitely a place for them in those markets. It's just, it takes a little while to change consumer habits and behaviours. So, um, 
but yeah, we, we are going out there. We go out there quite a lot. We have um, importers in various countries across the EU. We work very closely with them on activating in the market um, and promoting the wines. We also work very closely with the wider community, the, the wine, English wine, um, wine GB, I suppose, committee. So we work very closely with other, other producers and, and jointly promote the category. Um, so as an example, just outside of the EU, but in the US, we, we, we go out as English wine producers together. Um, and even in Germany, actually, in Provine, we, we take an English wine producer stand together and promote the category as a whole. Um, so we're doing quite a lot to, to promote our wines overseas. Thank you. Um, someone did actually ask, do you know who your distributor is in Italy? So we don't actually, we don't have an it Italian distributor at the moment, but I know English producers are actively in the market. Okay. Um, so I know Wiston are in the market. Um, I think Gusborne might be as well. Um, a couple of others as well. Perfect. And um, people are keen to visit. Someone says, do you have tours for visiting? And obviously you've, obviously maybe not at the moment, but normally you would. So what would be the best way for, for people to come and visit you when hopefully things return to normal? Yeah, of course. I think, um, so we, we run uh, tours all throughout the year. Um, obviously when COVID is not around, um, we're currently working through process at the moment and waiting to hear out further information on when we're going to be able to get those up and running again. Um, in addition to the tours and tastings, which you can book on through our website, um, I think the best way to, to sort of find out and keep up to date with us is, is just to sign on to our newsletter. Um, and we'll, we'll put out further information on when you can come and visit. Um, but in addition to that, we have a cellar door, which is open every day, um, obviously when COVID's not around, um, where you can just pop in and taste the range. Um, so there's always someone on hand to, to take you through um, and you're welcome to you know, purchase a bottle or two after. Um, but the tour's very good. It's, it's sort of a, an hour and a half to two hour visit um, where we, you know, you cover the sort of vineyard, winery, um, wine production aspects of things. Um, and then you, um, yeah, you taste the full range after. So it's, it's a really good visit and good insight on, into Ridgeview. Um, and there's been quite a few developments at, at Ridgeview in recent years. Um, we built a new winery last year. Um, so you should definitely come and visit. Um, another thing to look out for is uh, Ridge Fest. Um, so it's a big festival, consumer facing festival that we launched back in 2018 um, or 2017. Um, and um, it's, a, it's essentially a big festival at the vineyard. So I think this year we were planning, which sadly we had to, to cancel last minute because of the ongoings, um, but we were planning around about a thousand people at the vineyard, live music, food, lots of sparkling, and uh, that sort of thing. So um, hopefully, yeah, keep your eyes out for that 2021 in August next year. Ridge Fest will be hopefully going ahead. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds great, fingers crossed. Um, another question which um, I think Mardi did actually answer in, in the chat, but just for the benefit of the recording or if anyone else was wondering, um, was do you vinify the, the tie and the cuvee separately? We do, yes, we do. Yeah, yeah so, um, yeah, so uh, as I said, the, the two different pressings, the three different varietals across all the parcels and uh, vinified separately so we can really um, pick out the different qualities and characters of those those parcels brilliant thank you and um patrick mcwigan the cheese expert has joined in from brighton and was asking the very easy to answer question of how important is terroir in your wines um <laughs> which is which is a big question so feel free question. to uh, i knew i knew that would creep up at some point <laughs> yeah the dreaded t word <laughs> oh dear so i think at the moment i think um the the answer to that is is quite short sadly um but we are the vines at the moment are too young to really work out the the the, the terroir in the uk so th there's been a little bit of work i think in particular with the varietal bacchus um but as an industry we're yet to sort of discover you know what terroir means in the UK um, and I think that's just related to the you know the age of the vines and how young a lot of them are um, because you know plantings have really come on in the last you know five ten years so um, so yeah it's quite it's quite difficult to answer that question no one really knows the answer yet I think a lot of people have been focused on increasing annual yield um, over um, you know working out the difference say between us and our neighbour down the road at the moment I think it's very important and it, and it will definitely come about but at the moment I think with that in mind and, and the sort of age of the vines it's yeah it's very difficult to understand terroir in the UK so sorry Patrick <laughs> it's, it's a mean question and yes yeah, as a you know such a relatively young uh, industry as well and I think there's so many different contributing um, factors yeah. 
How would you, though, someone else asked, how, how does English sparkling compare to other sparkling styles? Is there uh, a comparison that you like to draw or do you like to sort of think of it as having its own identity? It's, uh... I think it definitely has its own identity. So, you know, given our northern latitude in that longer growing window, the fruit is definitely, you know, it displays this, you know, super high level of acidity and fruit concentration. So, you know, and I think it's written in our um, PDO as English quality sparkling wine is that um, if you compare the fruit, you know, say from England versus our good friends over in Champagne, um, you know, it, it should, in theory, the fruit should taste, you know, more sort of concentrated in its aromatics and fruit profile than, you know, the Champagne region because of the, the longer hang time and that sort of key, um, you know, window that it has on the vine so i think the styles of, of english versus other other regions you've got this you know this super clean pure fresh acidity coupled with you know intense fruit concentration um, and you know taste them side by side and uh, you know kind of you, you know you you'll definitely be able to to, to tell um, and we, we've heard feedback from a number of competitions as well and um you know the stylistically um you know they We've been fortunate to enter sort of final rounds of you know the judging stages um, and, and won some very nice awards. Um, but you know the feedback's always very different styles, um, and it's you know on the day it's you know it's very difficult to actually because you know they're points wise they're pretty much the same. It's just it's, it just ends up being done to the style on the day. So um, yeah, I definitely think pure fruit concentration with this sort of clean key acidity um, definitely defines the UK and English sparkling. Thank you. Um, someone asked, asked um, what percentage of reserve wines do you use? Um, it's probably around about 20% in our non-vintages. Um, we, we have been very fortunate over the years that demand has outstripped supply. Uh, and as we've grown, it's, it has continued to grow. Um, so, you know, we actually had to make um, the decision back in, um, you know, 20 whenever we started the non-vintages, that actually we need to start holding some reserve wine back, um, you know, as a strategic goal to get this consistency year on year. Um, so I'd say about 20% is, is, you know, a good, a, good, um, a good amount that we add into it. And that's the real benefit, isn't it? Of obviously it's your 25th uh, anniversary and there's a lot of more recent English and growers and sparkling producers and to have those sort of, you know, reserves of wine um, is definitely an advantage for, for blending, isn't it? For sure. Really, um, I, I think I know the answer to this one, but a couple of people asked it. So um, it was just about whether you had any interest in at Ridgeview in doing still wines. Uh, not for the foreseeable. <laughs> yeah, I know you but, get uh, asked that a lot. <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, yeah, there, there's some great producers, um, you know, producing some wonderful still wines. Um, but yeah, at Ridgeview, I think the focus is, has always been sparkling and I think always will. I think, the, you know, we just want to focus on excelling in that one area and really delivering, you know, high quality. So sparkling, sparkling always, I think. Yeah. Someone else asked, would you consider Bacchus as a, an ingredient or a varietal in the blend? Or, um... I think not, not at Ridgeview. I think the focus will always be the, the key, the, the sort of main three. Um, I think Simon, uh, our winemaker, would probably like to have a bit more experimentation and play around with Mernia, um, which is always, you know, it always causes a bit of a, a stir sometimes because Mernia sometimes can be seen as that sort of lesser varietal. I've, I've personally tasted a lot of Mernia base, base wine and sort of Van Clare and at blending, and it always stands out as being this exceptional varietal with some real charm. Um, so I, I think. Yeah, I'm sort of going off on a tangent, but yeah, I think we'll always focus <laughs> on the three vitals, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Many. <laughs> so with, with that in mind, is there, are you looking to like expand at Ridgeview or it, perhaps, you know, in the future have some, some different bottlings or, or, or broaden the range or are you quite happy with that sort of course six? Uh, there might be a bit of new product development on the horizon, but oh. uh, <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, watch, watch this space. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have a little look for that. But um, yeah, I think the core range is, is definitely uh, there to stay. You know, there might be one or two extras. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's about um, all that we have time for. And we 
pretty much got through through uh, most of the questions. So thank you so much, Brandon, for taking us no through problem at all. Uh, English sparkling wine in general, the story of Ridgeview, what what you do particularly, uh, and also answering all the the questions, which I'm sure you filled uh, a lot. So thank you so much to to yourself for your time, for Mardi as well, who's helped uh, answer some of the the other questions on the chat. And um, yes, I just put up the final slide there. So if you would like to get in touch with Ridgeview, obviously, yeah, sign up to a newsletter. You'll be able to hear when the tours are, are going again. Because yeah, I, I'm definitely going to be first on the list, hopefully, or, or definitely on the list. <laughs> I'm not putting myself first, um, but definitely would want to to come down. And and you've also got the school details as well. So if you want to to look for any more um, the tastings, or you can find the recordings of this as well. But thank you, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for, for coming. Thank you for your thank you very much. Uh, questions, interesting and intelligent questions. And yeah, thank you again, Brandon, and have a brilliant English Sparkling Wine Week and good luck with all your, your other events. Um, Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lydia. <laughs> and um, yeah, hopefully see you all at Bridgeview very soon and stay safe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>